I'd like to walk you through each one of these issues, and then uh, we can um, open it up to discussion. Next. So the second problem, before I go into that, is that uh, most new open spaces currently being built in India are inside gated communities and office parks and not really public. So right now, if you look at this moment, I think there is a real crisis of urban spaces going on. Next. Um, the other problem that is uh, happening is that uh, uh, there's uh, really a divide between haves and have-nots, which is increasing around the world, but nowhere as severely as in countries like India. And so the poor people are being left out of amenities of uh, reasonable housing and unfortunately also of many public spaces. Uh, so those are the issues I would also like to deal with. Next. Uh, the fourth problem is that the real ultimate public space in every city is its streets. And right now, we are not designing streets for people, but designing streets for cars. And that's another thing I would like to talk about. So then let me get on with the three main things that I mentioned uh, uh, we will talk about. Next, please. So that is public spaces for ecological resilience. Next. Uh, let me start by, with the example of Calcutta. Uh, Calcutta, as you might, uh, many of you might know, uh, has this eastern Kolkata um, uh, wetlands. And, and it's an amazing system that really the whole world should learn from, and India definitely should learn on, uh, learn from as we build our, uh, uh, you know, sewage treatment plants and our waste management systems. Here is a completely ecological um, system that is the lungs of the city, that is the open space, people go and party there, uh, and uh, uh, most of the sewage of the um, city actually goes through bioswales and phytoremediation and then reaches these farms and fish ponds, and uh, which provide 50% of Calcutta's fish and uh, uh, vegetables and uh, and and there's no smell. There's a, it's a really uh, tight system where a lot of fishermen and uh, farmers depend on it, and they keep it clean. They keep it going. Uh, next, but we have a problem here as well, and the problem is uh, of corporate capture. And by that I mean that because it is now the city has grown really close to it. Bit by bit, the government is starting to allow big corporations to uh, to build on it. So the Salt Lake City, uh, the hotshot new area in Calcutta, is actually built on what was a part of East Calcutta wetlands, and I call it corporate capture. So big companies and uh, uh, usually in collaboration with the government are actually building on our public spaces and our open spaces and wetlands. And uh, uh, the Calcutta wetlands is actually a Ramsar uh, protected site by the United Nations uh, um, agreement, but still it is in danger. So I want to just bring to your attention that a lot of our public spaces are in danger of being built upon. Next. Um, everyone, uh, when I talk about public space in India and I say, oh, there are no new public spaces being built, and people will say to me, no, 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 look at Sabarmati Riverfront. And I tell them that's really a bad example, and I hope it's not going to be replicated in many, many uh, rivers in many cities, uh, which is right now actually being talked about. Why do I say that is not a good idea? Because it has caused huge ecological damage. There's amazing amount of channelization and concretization of the river bank to make it into a public space and release a lot of real estate areas by moving the communities that lived around the river. Uh, but this much concrete and uh, this really artificial putting uh, dams and making it into almost a lake. So at least in that part of Ahmedabad, it's going to look nice. And uh, yes, I, I've seen it uh, at times when there are a lot of people, but most of the times I've seen it, there's nobody there uh, because it is um, also cut off by automobile transportation. So if that's the kind of public spaces we are building, we really need to step back and think about them. Next. Uh, next. I want to talk about uh, 
the example of Pune now. Uh, I, I run a studio at Columbia University and uh, uh, we work in different cities around the world in the international studio and this year we are working in Pune and also in Vietnam in Kanta. But in Pune, uh, we are particularly working with the Mulamota River. And on your uh, left, you see the current proposal, which is actually by, by, proposed by the same architect who did the Ahmedabad the Sabarmati River. And it's the same formula that you make it like picture perfect for at least some time, some length of the river by channelizing and concretizing that. And then what and then really ecological disasters happen before and after that beautiful stretch. And that's not how we see it. So my studio has proposed something uh, like you see on the right, and we will be taking this work back uh, through the uh, Rockefeller 100 Brazilian Cities project uh, to say that here's an alternative that would be much more ecologically beneficial to the city and the region and still provide the public access and bird life and the flora and fauna that we need. Next. Uh, so, uh, so this is where we are in terms of, you know, really major public spaces in India. But I also want to draw your attention to the concept of Medan, which is a really special, uh, typical Indian flexible public space, which is open to all. It's used for cricket matches, it's used for parties, picnics, morning walks, exercises. But then it's also a place of social resilience. Uh, um, almost every Indian city had a Ramli Lamadan or the Shara ground or some kind of a ground that was really unprogrammed and open and also open to, uh, you know, holding rain and holding floodwaters in case they should come. But unfortunately, we are not, if you look around India, we're not really building many Madans right now, which is a typology we should really look carefully at and, and go back to. Next. I would now like to talk about public spaces for social resilience. And this is my really, really passion, uh, big passion. And uh, I try to bring it in my work as well as my teaching because public spaces are venues for celebration, social economic transactions, and people of all social, religious, and economic backgrounds. And that's how you get the urban identity, a common identity that people can be proud of. Next. Next. Uh, so um, let's um, for a minute uh, talk about, uh, you know, where, how did we get to this point that uh, we don't even think about streets as an ultimate public space, because in my mind, street is the ultimate public space of the cities. And I want to, like, it's very fashionable now to blame Corbusier and modernists because Corbusier said that uh, street is a public enemy. It wears us out and disgusts us. And so, you know, everything, but street is not. Street is fabulous, but we've somehow taken that, that mantra and, uh, you know, been building uh, towers in the park. Next. Uh, even though in the West, people have really gone away from that model based on Jane Jacobs' work and realizing that that type of tower in the park really doesn't work and bringing back streets next. Uh, but uh, in India, the most vibrant part of the city is actually the streets. It's, uh, uh, you know, it's where action happens, life happens, people enjoy themselves and people from all walks of life can be there. And uh, uh, but uh, right now, either in Gurgaon or on outskirts of Mumbai or Pune or any city you can think about, what the typology that is being built is really tall towers, and they're not really towers in the park with any kind of ideology, but they are simply because they're the cheapest thing to build, and there's such huge demand for housing in India that everything gets lapped up. So there's really um, no public and uh, no really requirements here. And uh, so we need uh, public space that's open to all, but then the kind of open space that is being built is inside these gated communities, which have security guards. It's very funny that so many Indian politicians call themselves chokidars now, but the real problem is that these gated communities are guarded by chokidars and the spaces are not public spaces open to everyone. Next, please. Uh, so uh, this is actually just uh, to draw your attention to 
that please do think about street as ultimate public space. This is uh, with herbs, user generated cities. Uh, we had an exhibition at MoMA uh, to draw attention to uh, this kind of urbanism that is really vital. Next. Um, same thing, this is from Hyderabad. Next. And uh, the real enemy of uh, uh, these uh, uh, shopping streets is actually <laughs> the shopping malls, which once again are exclusive. So we are really dividing our city uh, into haves, uh, city of haves and cities of have nots. And for my mind, that is a really big danger to watch out in public space creation and maintenance. Next. Uh, so this is uh, the phenomenon happening not just in India, but it's happening everywhere. And uh, here are two pictures from China. You build uh, towers uh, in some like cheapest land, which is usually outside the city. And then you have to build these highways. And the biggest uh, traffic jam you might know happened in, uh, in the world happened in Beijing when the roads were uh, clogged up for a month. Uh, because after a while, people waited for a, a whole day, and then they just left. And then the cars took a month to clear. So that's not the kind of urbanism we want. We need to come back to inner city. Uh, type of street-based urbanism. Uh, the uh, the uh, development on your right is actually uh, uh, you know a whole town built outside the city, and a lot of these buildings are empty. Uh, next, yeah, when you build outside of the city, you know how are people going to commute to work? So people often don't move. It's happening at a very very large scale in South America. Uh, this is a picture from. Uh, uh, from Mexico, but it's also happening in Brazil, where the government really wants to build low income housing. So they give the money to developers and, okay, go build 6,000 homes or, you know, 20,000 homes, and they will be built on cheapest farmland so far away from the city and disconnected from any amenities and uh, with no public space, no way for people to even form a community. Next. Uh, so public spaces are important at all scales uh, for them to be socially successful at micro neighborhood scale. Uh, so people can sit on the stoops, women can do crafts or something like it always was the tradition in India. Next. Um, and the tradition of even low income housing in India is like jaw housing. Uh, and other um, low rise housing developments where there was sufficient public space. Next. But, uh, but that is not what is actually uh, being built now. What is being built now uh, are very different type of, uh, you know, gated communities. Next. Um, the one before that, please. Go back to the slide. Yeah, no, the one after. <laughs> so um, I just want to draw your attention to, uh, once again, thinking of street as the ultimate public space, the sidewalk as the ultimate public space. And uh, right now, we are in so many cities ripping up sidewalks and making more space for cars. And the car ownership in some cities could be 5%, 10%, uh, but we are not designing for the 90%. Next. Uh, this is a picture of how you can actually take back public space from the street. Uh, the picture on your left is the, um, the situation in most, uh, you know, large traffic crossings in India. And the picture on the right, it's the work of NACTO and the municipal uh, corporation and the traffic uh, um, department and taking back space, tightening the space for cars and widening the space for pedestrians. Next. Uh, so this is another example um, in Mumbai. This is close to a railway station and what happened here in Badra Plaza, there was a very, very active uh, market in the morning. It was a wholesale market and then 
uh, another lower um, lower intensity market during the day, but then they cleaned it up in the name of development and prioritized it for car. So not only do we need to be creating public spaces, but we need to be actually maintaining and preserving and fighting for what we already have. Next. Uh, so this is what we are building right now. Uh, this is a project by Slum Redevelopment Authority in Mumbai in Gawandi. And uh, so we are saying that, OK, slums are bad. Mostly slums are being removed from the center of city because the real estate is so uh, so uh, expensive now. And then people are being warehoused, people you know, in this kind of architecture. I don't even know who can design that. But there's no public space. There is no social space. Next, please. And so this kind of development is, is really, uh, you know, not we should be thinking about. Uh, so this is the Ravi. There's been a project to really uh, clean, you know, in the words of SRA, Slum Redevelopment Authority, to clean it up and move people out. But let's just a little bit go under the roofs and see what's happening inside. Next, please. Uh, because the Ravi survives and contributes a million dollars, a, a billion dollars to Mumbai's economy every year, because people there are actually very productive and there are social units there. There are the 90 separate, uh, um, you know, communities and nuggers there, and this kind of micro open space that helps people to stay socially coherent and be able to depend on each other when there's very few other amenities. Next. Uh, so the work I'm showing uh, here is done uh, in partnership with Herbs. Herbs is another nonprofit that I founded, and Rahul uh, and uh, Echanobe and Matthias um, are the uh, partners who've been very involved in this work with me. And uh, so uh, this is a street in the Ravi which. Uh, at the time that people uh, need to pray, uh, the Muslim population needs to pray, they close half the street and it becomes a public space and a mosque. And as soon as that is over, the street is opened again. Then it might be closed again for another festival or a Ganesh festival or something. So the, this is a street working like a medan in the sense of very flexible space. And where in places where um, a space is really tight, we really need to be thinking about the medan concept and flexible public spaces. Next. Uh, so this is also in the Ravi. Picture on the left is a cricket ground which survives because cricket is so sacred in India. Uh, but thinking about sacred spaces, uh, um, you know, it's fine, it's good, but not if they are not in, uh, not if they are not inclusive. So we want to think about inclusive public spaces. And the place on the right in the Ravi is actually the fish market, which is the women's public space. Uh, so um, this Tata Institute actually did sari mapping to see in the Ravi where the women can hang out and where, what is their public space. And there were many more public spaces for men than women, which is another big in issue in India. Next. Uh, this is um, uh, done by BMW uh, workshop and again finding in India that women, uh, most women felt threatened in most public spaces and there's very little in uh, usual public spaces in India that is uh, comfortable and accessible to them. Next. Uh, so um, just the uh, next few slides we can just quickly flip through please. And these, this is all the work of herbs, working with local people. Next, I just flip through the next few slides. And so we trained local people to survey and find where the social networks are. Next. Local people can be the best researchers in their area. The other thing I think in India we can learn from is the tradition of inclusive rituals. And, uh, you know, whether it's Ganpati or whether it is Chitrai festival. Next, please. Uh, so I think we should learn from these uh, rituals uh, to see how they bring people of all, uh, all religions and rich and poor all together. And that's what our public spaces should be. Uh, this is actually in the on the dry riverbed uh, in Madurai. Next, uh, but uh, you know many rivers in uh, in India are not 
um, not they don't don't run year round. So that's another opportunity. So of course we need to have formal um, public spaces, but then uh, seasonal public spaces like this are also important. And the key is to bring everyone together next. Because when people meet each other, they rub shoulders with the rich and poor. That's how they become less afraid of each other and, and uh, um, you know, the city improves in terms of its uh, security and uh, harmony and opportunities for everyone. Rituals like this, uh, of course, help create uh, urban identity. This is from Tokyo, where I had a chance to live for um, more than 20 years. Next. Uh, so let's think about the public space for financial resi uh, resilience next. Uh, and that's a key point. Sometimes if you develop um, public space and, and your client is saying that, no, no, I can't afford to give up this expensive land, then, the, uh, then there are many arguments you can um, propose to say why public space is needed. Uh, this is the famous ca case of Medellin in Colombia in South America. And uh, uh, this was the murder capital of the world with so much violence and, and uh, uh, you know, because the city is uh, uh, the central area, which is very stable, is occupied by wealthy people and the hills on both sides are uh, uh, where the poor people and the slums and favelas are. So the last um, uh, or the last uh, three mayors actually and two most specifically decided that this was going to be, they were going to um, uh, implement social urbanism, which means that they were going to provide minimum necessary amenities to everyone, no matter where anyone lived, up on the hill or wherever. So they ran, ran up these trams and they, uh, every household had water supply and electricity. And then on the picture on the right is a library. They call it a library. Um, and they did actually an international competition to design these. And you may not think it's a beautiful building, uh, but um, but they said the most beautiful buildings should be in the poorest areas. And uh, these libraries are actually public spaces um, for people to come and meet, communities to learn new things, have shows, have movie screenings, and children come there after school to play. So it's a really high-end public space in the really low-end uh, residential area. Next, please. Um, and the results of this were really quite spectacular. Uh, in that uh, as they built more infrastructure, the murder rates went down and people's income went up. Next, please. And so this kind of social urbanism is now being proven around the world. So when it is uh, when your public space is a challenge, you should be able to say that, uh, you know, there's a big economic reason for it. This is in Chicago where uh, um, railway track, the area where the railway tracks was built into the Millennium Park and and there were so many economic opportunities around that in terms of real estate, businesses, job creation that opened up. Next. Uh, the same thing actually happened uh, uh, in uh, um, Bryant Park in New York, um, uh, which as the park was developed, uh, the opportunities, economic opportunities around that grew. Next. Uh, the next example is also from New York. It is in uh, um, Rockefeller Center. Even small public space, but strategically placed, can trigger many economic opportunities. Next. So there is an economic uh, argument as well for, uh, for you to uh, make when you want to design uh, public spaces. Uh, let's now talk about the participatory design and management of public spaces. Next, please. Uh, which is critical. Um, and uh, I think the experts need to really think about involving uh, local people in order to design the best space and also to make sure it will be maintained. The picture on the left is in the Ravi where we involve children also to visualize what their city should be. And the picture on the right is in Istanbul where with herbs we ran a workshop uh, to see what uh, the public spaces in uh, Sichan and Galata should be. And here people are sitting right in the middle of a public space, and that's what public space should be. People should be able to protest 
or um, you know meet or gather or discuss anything uh, because that's really what democracy is about democracy is about good public spaces they are necessary for good healthy democracy next Uh, so I want to introduce now the work of uh, Asia Initiative. Next, please. And uh, this is a nonprofit organization that I founded and I run. And we have developed a system of social capital credits, which is a community currency for social good. Next. And we have been using it uh, for actually uh, uh, helping create and sustain public spaces. Uh, so this is a system of barter, actually, people help to design social spaces and maintain them. And in turn, they earn social capital credits, which we call SOCs. And the SOCs are redeemable uh, for healthcare, education, and skill empowerment. Uh, um, and then if it's uh, in poor areas, it, this is really what people need to get out of poverty. But in wealthy areas, it could be things like yoga lessons, car sharing, and so on. Next, please. Uh, but this is really a way, systematic way to engage communities, and we are doing it in many countries around the world. Next, please. And uh, uh, and the system, really, I mean, there's a system of volunteerism, actually, but uh, making it very measurable and accountable so that volunteers don't do something and then after that they get tired and go away. This is in the United States in Washington, D.C., where we have a SOC game in which people can then vote for what is important for them in a public space. And then whichever item gets more votes, next please, uh, goes on the menu. Uh, uh, on the, we have an earning menu and a redeeming menu. This picture is in Pune, uh, where the drivers on the Mumbai Pune Expressway are um, helping create a menu that will run on an app uh, so that they can earn socks for good driving, putting seat belt on, and uh, reporting bad driving and uh, cars parked on the side and so on. Uh, next, please. So this is really a completely people people led system uh, which we call it uh, we start with socratic dialogue and this is our project in amravati which as you know is wanting to be the happiest city in india and uh, we won the, the uh, competition to help make it happy through social capital credits next please where we are incentivizing people to come forward and help design the public spaces uh, this is our dialogue in amravati and uh, uh, and so once people have uh, next please once people have their input into uh, the design they're more likely to watch out for uh, and help maintain it these are the kind of earning and redeeming menus we make next next please um, this is a project in kenya uh, turning a big garbage dump in a slum into wonderful kitchen gardens and public space. Next. And this is a similar uh, project we did in Ghana in a market that used to be very dirty. Next, please. And now it is super clean and areas have been paved and lighting put. Uh, this is in Madurai, where, as you know, the Waigai River is extremely polluted. And we proposed an idea of breaking up the river front into small um, lengths and making the communities behind that uh, custodians of that stretch of the river to make sure there's no sewage being dumped there and no garbage and no construction debris. Next, please. Uh, so uh, the idea is to localize this uh, uh, wherever uh, the project is and make it people-centric and people are the creators of the system and keepers of the system and we see ourselves simply as a, uh, as a resource and a facilitators. Next, please. Uh, so I think this is the end of my presentation. Next, please. And I'm just giving you my contact in case you would like to contact me after the Q&A also. Uh, please feel free to ask uh, any questions or give comments. Thank you. So we can now have some questions, right? Um, thank you, Professor. Thank you for this uh, 
sort of an inspiring presentation sharing like a wide range of cases uh, to learn the uh, and understand the significance of public space as an asset uh, with respect to uh, ecology social and um, financial um, aspect as such um i guess one which came to my mind and a question that we have from our colleague here is uh, how do you ensure that the development of new public space doesn't trigger gentrification around the area with higher land values uh you know that's an excellent question and we are actually suffering from that right now from this very famous the public space the high line that you might have all read about or uh heard about and uh, that care actually ran through a really poor area and that has now been gentrified uh amazingly so really the most fashionable buildings are being built there so yes that is a very big concern uh but also uh i want to say that if uh, the public and people living around there were involved in designing and building it the act of doing that will bring them together as a community and as a community then they can resist um, gentrification because gentrification only happens if a developer is able to buy bits and pieces here and then collect it together and then build higher end developments but if the community is really solid as it is in daravi actually daravi has resisted gentrification to a very large extent in mumbai in uh, the area of daravi but i think uh, the community coming together is key and helping design and being engaged in a public space is a very very strong way to bring communities together right um i guess there are two questions which are um looking at the same aspect so i'll probably ask one and then maybe follow up with the second one so um so you shared examples across uh, india from hyderabad bombay and pune with the characteristics of these spaces but um like your examples highlight that developers aren't obviously thinking about um public spaces and if we want to create more of them like who should we expect to champion them and um, also based on your experience if you could uh, share the process of engagement with the government if those are the people who has to, who have to champion it um to make them think differently in the apart from their conventional conventional approach to develop you know that's an excellent question thank you for asking and because i think ultimately the responsibility for this um depends or or resides with the government and the people first let us say the government uh, because uh, you know they absolutely need to be like the entire city of gurgaon has been built without any specific public space that is not private uh, you can talk about cyber hub or something but these are really uh, very uh, they are not inclusionary public spaces and all these gated communities have no i mean they weren't even asked to help with the infrastructure so you know the developers there made like 3 to 400% profit uh, which is unconscionable because the government is not playing its role as keeper of the social good the government has become monetizer of land and so uh, so why is that happening that is happening because of corporate capture these developers are so strong that they can just twist the municipalities and corporations any way they want and get away without having to provide uh, or fulfill their responsibility of infrastructure or public space uh, so then the question is uh, you know of course the uh, strengthening the planning departments of cities i can tell you in new york city uh, like half my students might graduate and join the city the other half might join the developers or you know professional offices and uh, so there are equal abilities on both sides and equal strength so there's a tension and public spaces get built and and saved and preserved uh but where the, there is asymmetry between the capabilities of the government uh, office uh, uh, planning office and the and the developer strength and uh, influence uh then that's a problem so how do we come uh, get around that problem and that problem can only be uh, turned around with very very strong 
uh, public awareness and public pressure. If the public says we need these public spaces and, and they need to be protected, like for example, uh, East Calcutta wetlands, if the public stands up and says we will not let this be encroached, then the politicians will not be uh, will, will will understand that and they will respect that and the government will follow but i think that uh, dialogue in our country about uh, um, urban issues such as this is very weak right now uh, there are very few newspapers um, writing about it. There's very few television channels talking about it. I think that our cities are actually deteriorating, whether it's in terms of pollution origins, it's in terms of inclusive public spaces. It's because the dialogue is in, uh, is insufficient. So as uh, professionals, as architecture students, um, we all need to really raise our voices and increase the dialogue. Uh, so that uh, public is more aware of their responsibility and uh, uh, and then subsequently the politicians and governments. Uh, but really it it has to be policy that for this much um, uh, you know development you need to create this much public space. And uh, you know it should be an open, transparent process and there should be clear guidelines on how it is to be maintained. I can tell you that when um, in New York, a developer um, makes a plaza and they are privately owned public spaces here, which the government controls. So the government will say there need to be 25 chairs and 30 trees. And the developer has to actually put give money to the government to be held in an account. So if three of those trees die, the developer is obliged to put back those three trees Otherwise, the government can use that fund to put them. So these kind of very tight systems need to be uh, need to be uh, established, and that is really uh, so. We have to up that. Uh, you know, what are we requiring from the developers uh, who are really designing our cities right now? Our cities are not being designed by architects and planners and planning offices of cities, but rather by developers. I guess um, as a follow up quickly as a thought, uh, because um, I um, experienced a, a similar problem in uh, King's Cross in London, where they're developing the King's Cross area. So also, it's, although it's a private development, there were uh, some people were not allowed in those public spaces. So there were no sec uh, cops or security guards, but there were normal clothes. But they would like peek over the phone and say like, there's this person entering, so please make sure they don't enter. Although there are no um, valid ways or any obstacle as such, it looks like it's free and accessible, but it really isn't. So I guess mm -hmm. accessibility also like kind of plays an important role when we make it an open space and private development space, which is open to public sort of a thing, I guess. Mm -hmm. Um, yeah, because I, I think that that kind of surveillance is only going to increase, um, you know, CCTV cameras. London has the most CCTV cameras of any city per capita of any city in the world. Uh, and we are seeing what is happening in some experiments being done in China. Uh, so, yeah, but that's a double edged sword because, uh, um, you know, you can also use information and communication technologies like satellite imaging and even Google Earth to see where the public spaces are being encroached upon and uh, take action on that. So, the, this technology can also be used to protect public spaces. Um, and, uh, you know, so then you have a proof like it's not like a government. Um, um, employee can go somewhere and then be bribed and come back and say no no the public space is not being encroached on now you have visual evidence you have mapping you have public maps that are available to everyone so so um you know um saving and and maintaining those private public spaces is easier but on the other hand who gets in is harder but in india of course there are no policies to say that you know poor people cannot come to these Spaces, but for example, shopping malls, there's always a guard who will not let a poor looking person get in. And, um, and you know, there's no space for drivers and maids who work in these gated communities to actually enjoy those public spaces. In some gated communities, I know they are not even allowed to walk on the grass or enter the grass area. 
So uh, I, I think this is a big societal issue. We have to, unless we begin to see ourselves as a more connected uh, uh, society, and we continue to exclude, uh, you know, parts of the population. I think this is this will continue to be an issue. But again, I think awareness building using the information and communication technologies can be a big, uh, you know, big way to to bring uh, uh, awareness to everyone. Um, so the next question we have is uh, from Humanshu, uh, I think student from SPA Delhi, if I'm not wrong. Uh, so he's asking about uh, parameters that could be used to, uh, uh, like, mostly the financial parameters, because you covered the aspect of finances. So if mm -hmm. there are any parameters that can be used to relate for spatial planning and decision-making process, so how do you decide that it has this financial gain or an impact such? Right. Uh, Himanshu, I'm also from SPA Delhi, so uh, a big hello to you. Um, yes, I think that it is very difficult to justify the creation of really grand, wonderful public spaces based on money alone. Yes, you can say that they will increase the real estate uh, value all around that public space, and we have many, many examples to show for that. But I think unless you bring the social capital and ecological capital into the calculation, it's uh, uh, you cannot really justify it on economic benefits alone. Uh, so I would highly recommend that you bring all three, uh, like a triple bottom line of financial, social, and economical accounting into it, and then be able to present uh, uh, the design and the desirability of the public space. And, uh, uh, and uh, uh, you know, there, and, and I think the best way to show that would not just be by hard financial numbers, but by precedence and the, uh, and the results that they have had. So I think that that would be the route I would take. You know, for example, we are supposed to uh, provide environmental impact statements, right? Uh, so so uh, environmental impact statement for the public space is extremely strong. I know that you don't have to do that for small public spaces, but why not, you know, show, show that as a way, as a methodology, and say this is the uh, financial impact of it, and this is the social and the, and the ecological impact. I think then it becomes very much more uh, strong. And triple bottom line accounting, uh, methodology is actually increasing around the world. Uh, in United States, there is something called G Corp, that is, uh, no, B Corp, Beneficial Corporations, B Corp, and uh, companies like Patagonia, who makes ski wear and so on. Um, you know, they are starting to report their financial, ecological, and uh, social bottom line, and it's becoming very popular in Australia as well. Um, and I think that that's where the world really needs to go. And we designers um, and architects and urbanists can actually lead in that. Uh, so yes, I, I wouldn't, uh, I mean, there's some matrix around you could use. Uh, I'm happy to help you with that. Uh, I can send you some things, but generally I think you have to bring uh, social, ecological and financial capital to justify um, you know, because we, India has a tradition of grand, big public spaces that were celebratory, where, you know, cities were proud of these spaces, but we don't seem to be building any new ones. Uh, when I talk to people, they talk about uh, uh, either Sabarmati riverfront, or they talk about some religious big temples with public spaces that are being built. And for me, that is not enough. It should really be social spaces. Um, which are not so like uh, dependent on real estate, but you know, really for the good of the people, for social good. And uh, so, yeah, we need to change the paradigm there a little bit. Um, thank you, ma'am. Um, so the next question we have is from um, Trivia Bombay. So I looking, I mean, you just covered the. Um, uh, financial aspect of it, but they are looking more, asking you the question more on the social aspect of it, and also the SOCC that uh, you spoke about in Pune. Um, mm -hmm. so they want to know more about how that exactly works, and if there are any news for the same in Bombay. 
I mean, you could answer this, or maybe we can get in touch with this offline later to to answer this question, maybe. Yeah, you know that a lot of information about our methodology of social capital credits is on our website. The website is uh, asiainitiatives.org. So Asia Initiatives is one word, A-S-I-A -A initiatives, <laughs> ending with a S, asiainitiatives.org. And you can uh, um, look at that, and it describes the methodology, how it works, and many examples of where we have used it for different things. And uh, I'm happy to also answer any questions afterwards, if you would like. Um, so I think this would be pretty much the last question. So I'm also, um, you've covered the ecology, social, and financial, which looks at the stresses that a city faces already based on maybe the community development or like urbanization, affordability of housing and things like that. But I'm curious to know more on your thoughts as to how public space can address like a shock, like a flooding or something of that sort. Because we do have examples like in Rotterdam where public spaces do convert into like uh, water holding areas and things like that. So mm -hmm. if you know of anything like in India or how those can be um, and like infrastructure can be like doubled up into a public space, which also can be used during a shock as such, maybe. Mm -hmm. Yes, actually, if you look at traditional Indian cities, this was really included very, very nicely thought out. For example, Medan is a typical kind of public space, which is, um, you know, where a flood can be, part of the flood can be held and it soaks and water, groundwater is recharged. So, so all through, in, in particularly in cities like Varanasi and Madurai, you see that there were a system of tanks uh, from a higher tank to a slightly lower tank to a slightly lower tank, and this was in Calcutta as well, that you see that they were connected. That means that when there was a, you know, a torrent of rain, it was held in these tanks before it came down to the river and, and became a flood. So there were many holdings. And so now what has uh, recently happened is that we have, um, you know, filling these, uh, we have been filling these tanks and building even government housing on that. So those uh, wonderful traditional systems we had have been lost, but they really need to be recognized and revived. Not only these holding places, whether they are tanks uh, or madans or, um, uh, you know, that flow into each other, uh, but uh, uh, to recognize them, but also to uh, preserve the connections, because it's that entire system that can work. And once that system is broken, then people are saying, okay, there are floods. The other reason for floods is amazing amount of deforestation that happens and the, uh, 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 and the green areas, which once again are really important elements of a resilient city, which we have been losing uh, in urban areas, but also on the outskirts of urban areas. Either the trees are cleared out for agriculture or, uh, you know, timbering. And uh, so, yes, so I think it, it takes us to the discussion of public space and open space and green space and resilient space to a larger than a city scale. So we need to zoom out and see the region, see the surroundings of the city. Yeah. We, I guess, towards the closing, we have a few more questions. So maybe we'll take one more question, if that's all right. So this is from a student from SPA Bhopal. Um, so it's quite a long question, basically. So I'll just probably just read out what she's typed in. Um, this is uh, Akanksha. So she's curious to know more on the role that the planners have when a government is approving a project, like maybe a coastal road, uh, maybe which still hasn't got any clearances, but like it's on ground and get going forward. Um, so reclamation in a large scale by fishermen communities are uh, at stake and of course the ecosystems. So she's asking if public awareness is what that can save us and how do these get approved? Like how to go forward from that? And I'm guessing more mm -hmm. she's questioning the role as a planner as to what mm -hmm. role they can play during such uh, condition. <laughs> Yeah, if I'm not mistaken, you might be thinking about the Mumbai's uh, coastal road. That, that is, yeah. uh, it wasn't even designed fully and it already started construction. 
and it is it has huge ecological uh, detriments to the entire area and the livelihoods and the really big question is why are we dumping so much money on car oriented infrastructure if the same money was used in public transport or even water based infrastructure we would be very much better off in terms of mobility in terms of environment in terms of uh, the uh, um, you know social impact so i think all those um, i think that's actually a completely uh, we should all be alarmed about that and we should really be thinking about and talking about and and writing about this because it's uh, it, it, i mean this coastal road is completely irresponsible in my opinion and uh, uh, yes so what is the role of the planner in fact, the committee that signed off on it does include planners, including heads of department of architecture of certain schools, and uh, uh, and people who we might have considered to be responsible um, uh, planners uh, and uh, individual um, professionals. However, that has been done, but then there's no thorough environmental impact statement. It's just like very, very flimsy. And there's no social impact statement at all. So I think that right now is a good time for everyone to really raise their voices and demand that these be done before any further work um, gets done on it. So yes, mistakes get made like this one. Um, you know, it's a mistake to get it started. But I think uh, um, a very informed and active citizenry that understands these issues. And, and you know, a lot of burden falls on us architects, planners, urban designers, academics, that if we understand these issues, we really need to uh, bring the public along so these uh, sort of things don't happen. Uh, so yeah, yeah, this, is, this can only happen because the government is not well informed. I don't think the government people are bad people. I don't think the politicians are bad people. I think the level of understanding of the issues and how um, the issues have not been uh, articulated to them strongly enough. I think that's the issue. So sometimes we can, uh, you know, present our arguments in jargon and don't do that. Present your arguments in really simple ways that uh, politicians and government and and um, people understand that because I think in the end of the day, everyone wants to do the right thing. Uh, but uh, sometimes with the uh, uh, corporate capture of cities and uh, uh, pressure from developers, you know, pouring concrete is a lot of money for somebody. Uh, so this, uh, you know, this needs to be balanced. But I think we just need to get stronger and raise the political dialogue and the public dialogue about this. Thank, thank you so much, Professor. Um, I guess we've, we'll probably wrap it up. And uh, we've covered a lot of aspects and try to, by the end of it, look at the role of what a planner has to do. I think that's like an eternal question of every planner and designer as to what they can do. So that's mm -hmm. amazing. Thank you so much. Don't, uh, don't for... underestimate what you can do. Do not underestimate what you can do. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's a very good point to take back. Um, we just have another question that came in, so we would probably take that as well. If that's all right. Sure, I'm I'm happy to take it. Um, I guess it's again about how do we convince the decision makers and people representatives about doing the right thing. I guess I'm just summing up the entire question to like ask this. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I guess you did cover um, it up in your previous one. Yeah. I did, I did. But you know, bring all your all your skills to the fore. Uh, let us say, um, you know, you are writing a long article. Chances are somebody is not going to read it. If you're writing a very long report, chances are the politicians and the government doesn't government officials, or decision makers don't have time to read it. Okay, can you begin to uh, create your arguments with highlights? You know. Uh, large print headings and then explanation if somebody wants to read it. But another really important media not to be missed is documentaries and films and short clips and YouTube, you know, three minutes, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. Uh, you want to start putting your argument in, in 
visual form because we all know how to do that in graphic form we all know how to do that pulling in examples nothing speaks louder than you know clear examples um, and uh, and so we should we should really I, I don't think we teach that in architecture schools we should teach people how to make simple arguments that can be understood uh, by politicians and uh, senior government officials and then you know you can always link it to uh, to a bigger report or to a you know more elegant explanation but headlines and uh, uh, you know short videos and short articles with very clear uh, messaging i think that's another uh, thing we need to improve on thank you professor that's like a big takeaway as to moving forward from students when they get into the professional life as to how they will translate this. Or even your students, look around the world, how what students are standing up for climate change around the world. Right. Students are a force. Please understand that and know your know how 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 much responsibility you have on your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> so I'll um also like to thank our participants and students from SPA Delhi, SPA Bhopal, Trivia, Indus, and a few other individual students who've joined us online for today. And uh, Professor for accommodating our request and like uh, doing this very early in the morning from your end to accommodate the students' request. So um, thank you so much. Um, our next uh, webinar is in April. Uh, early April. So this is by a professor from UPenn University. We'll share further details on Twitter. So please feel free to drop in a mail to me or uh, follow our Twitter hashtag Urban Resilience Unit for further updates. And uh, also feel free to share any feedback you'll want to give us. And if you'll want to hear about any other specific topics that you'll want to learn from, that would be really helpful. Thank you so much. Thank you, Professor, for joining us. Thank you. Okay.